The Vinegar Tasters is a famous painting from China that has a profound message. While the first two tasters do not enjoy the vinegar, the third finds it to be delightful. I think this is not just a comment on how attitude and perception affects life, but it also reflects reality. Sugar is sweet to the taste, but cloying, and will make you ill if you have too much. And not just in the short term, but especially in the long term. Vinegar has a strong taste and is hard to get used to, but can be almost addictive once you grow accustomed to it. It reduces inflammation in the body, and it has a direct effect on metabolic health. That makes it one of the most healthy substances you could ever ingest. Vinegar also increases uncoupling proteins, which increases the heat energy produced by cells, and gives long-term increases to your basal metabolic rate. This alone would be enough to lift the clouds of depression from many people, but it has also been proven to directly aid in depression. It even helps prevent cancer, and that's news good enough to make even the worst pessimist into an optimist. Tell me, what's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? An optimist says the drink is half full. A pessimist says the drink is half full, but I might have bowel cancer. Well, you likely know that MCT oil raises ketone levels. You likely have not heard the same is true of acetic acid, that is vinegar. In fact, while vinegar has many components that may aid health, even white vinegar has many surprising effects on metabolic health. Vinegar is the purest form of energy available to the cell. It is a short-chain fatty acid, and burning it allows the cell to not only avoid harmful byproducts of metabolism, but also causes the accelerated cleanup of these harmful byproducts. By increasing the cleanup actions, within proper oxidative phosphorylation to produce energy in the cell. This is especially useful for the brain, as neurons have more mitochondria than any other cell in the body, and they also consume far more energy. This helps rescue these cells, reduce insulin resistance, and increase energy production. For thousands of years, vinegar has been a large part of the human diet, It's also been the most important short-chain fatty acid in the body since the dawn of time, especially in the gut microbiome. In fact, it's the only short-chain fatty acid that your body actually needs to function, and the rest are simply acetic acid with a slight alteration that requires further processing to get to acetic acid. Low acetic acid in the gut is very strongly associated with dementia in the elderly, much more so than butyric acid in the gut, for example, even though that's what most people are talking about today. This may seem surprising, but acetic acid is the ultimate energy source used by every cell in the body. Fats and sugars are chemically chopped up into vinegar, which is ultimately used for fuel by the mitochondria. This short-chain fatty acid can also penetrate directly through cell membranes, and right through the mitochondria itself, even if the cell is completely insulin resistant. That is, even if the cell is rejecting further energy, this short-chain fatty acid can make its way inside and get it burning energy again and working properly. This means a boost of healthy, pure energy for even the sickest cell. Pure energy. Apoptosis is also controlled by signals from the mitochondria, so this energy can be used to cause apoptosis of malfunctioning cells. This includes both cancer cells and damaged senescent cells that cause inflammation and aging-related damage. In fact, many studies have shown that vinegar can reduce tumor size, both in the test tube and in animals, This is unsurprising when you realize that cancer ultimately has a metabolic origin and is related to mitochondrial dysfunction. So if we look at energy metabolism in normal cells, we see that the bulk of energy comes from oxidative phosphorylation. Now this is the cancer cell. 
energy is coming from totally different places, the majority of energy. So we get, cancer cell gets very little energy from oxidative phosphorylation because the cristae and the mitochondria are abnormal, as I've just shown you. But this cell still remains alive because it generates energy in the cytoplasm with lactic acid as a waste product, which is the Warburg effect, or succinic acid as a waste product coming from the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle and glycolysis generate the majority of energy through substrate level phosphorylation, a non-oxidative process, where much less energy now comes from, a, from uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the key shift. The cancer cell is generating energy through different processes. So the question now, how, how does this relate to dysregulated cell growth? How does this disturbed energy metabolism link to the hallmarks of the disease? And this is what we've been able to show. We've been able to reconfigure the landscape of understanding cancer by placing the focus on the origin for this organelle, the mitochondria. So we know, and this was the concept of the oncogenic paradox that plagued and puzzled the field even to this day. You'll read and see many examples where people simply don't understand how all the provocative agents that have been linked to the origin of cancer could cause the disease through a common pathophysiological mechanism. Carcinogens cause cancer. We know that. Uh, that's why they're called carcinogens. They cause cancer. Carcinogens damage, enter the mitochondria, and damages oxphos. Radiation can damage oxidative phosphorylation, leading to the origin of cancer. Intermittent hypoxia damages mitochondria, leading to the origin of cancer. Inflammation can damage mitochondrial function. Chronic inflammation is a known risk factor for the development of cancer. Rare inherited mutations like the BRCA1 and the leaf many mutations that people recognize, they operate by damaging mitochondria. The RAS oncogene is known to be a facilitator of cancer. It damages mitochondria. Viruses, we know of many different kinds of viruses, the papillomavirus, hepatitis C virus. Viruses can cause cancer because they either the virus themselves or the products of the virus damage the mitochondria. And of course, aging. A cancer is higher in older people than younger people. Age damages by just living on the planet. Age will damage mitochondria. While you'll see articles online questioning the value of apple cider vinegar, realize that science and the trillion dollar medical industry are not one and the same. In fact, they're usually at odds. The actual science shows amazing benefits, but the corrupt medical schools claim there is no evidence, even though you can see the experimental results for yourself. Sadly, Bill Gates now owns Bragg's apple cider vinegar, which has to make one question what the product's future might be. That's not the end of the world though, because even distilled vinegar will have many benefits. And for fruit vinegars, the darker it is, the better it is likely to be, as it will have more polyphenols and other exotic compounds. So you might want to pick up some Japanese or Chinese vinegar instead anyway. These fruit vinegars are full of unique alkali stable lipids or ASLs, which have experimentally been shown to cause immediate relief to symptoms of dementia and even increase learning ability in mouse experiments. To me, however, the biggest benefit for the brain is the effect on mood. Whenever I take some vinegar, I get an immediate positive boost to my mood. Even if I was not feeling sad at all, I feel surprisingly positive and energetic. This also comes on very rapidly for me, which is quite surprising. So many supplements seem to do very little or only make a gradual change over time, but this has a dramatic and immediate effect. But whatever form of vinegar you take, the acetic acid itself is proven to reduce insulin insensitivity. It will also increase the amount of energy burned by mitochondria by upregulating uncoupling proteins, and this will increase your BMR in the long term, not just the short term. This is especially important for the liver, allowing it to burn liver fat and stay healthy. This is important for the whole body as your liver dictates your metabolic health, 
And once it becomes dysfunctional, type 2 diabetes is right around the corner. Now the liver. The liver, I believe, is one of the unsung heroes or unappreciated heroes when it comes to um, uh, human metabolism. And there are two processes I want to highlight, and that is the liver's ability to both make lipid and to make glycogen, the storage form of glucose. So it's uh, the liver's one of the one of the tricks the liver has to once li once ins uh, glucose has been pulled in, it will um, store it. So it's just a way to help um, buffer the glucose levels in the blood. If glucose levels are high, the liver can pull in some of that more than what it needs for its own energy demands. And then when glucose goes low, the liver can break that glycogen down and share it with the blood or with the body. So that's the de definitions there, the production of fat and the production of, of glycogen. Insulin, of course, as it has its hand in so many things, also has its hand in these events as well. In particular, it stimulates both of them. Insulin will both st stimulate the production of lipid and the production of glycogen. With insulin resistance in the liver, there's an interesting phenomenon, and it is reflective of the fact that insulin resistance is not just a global effect within the cell. It is not that every event that insulin used to do is not happening. And, and let me get into that, to, just to make that clear. When the liver is insulin resistant, lipogenesis is still activated when insulin comes knocking at the door, so to speak, when insulin binds its insulin receptor. So to make that clear, even if the liver is insulin resistant, insulin can still stimulate lipogenesis. In contrast, <clears throat> in the insulin resistant liver, insulin is less able to make glycogen. So it's less able to tell the liver to store glucose. And this loss of stimulating glycogenesis means we have a reduction. We actually end up insulin loses its ability to prevent the breakdown of glycogen. So now we have glycogenolysis. This event is disrupted in insulin resistance. And so now we have a liver that is supposed to be holding on to glucose. It's actually letting it go, but it's not supposed to. Remember, that's the pathology here. Insulin is trying to stimulate or it ought to be stimulating glucose uptake and storage. It's not working anymore. So the liver doesn't get the signal not to break down glycogen, and so it does. It's not being inhibited, the glycogenolysis. And this, of course, drives up blood glucose levels. So once again, if we look at this paradigm of the progression towards full-blown type 2 diabetes, with the liver being insulin resistant, we've pushed that a little further down the road. The patient has progressed, progressed a little further towards full-blown type 2 diabetes. So they're getting this mounting hyperglycemia. Vinegar has also been shown to lower blood pressure to a similar degree as many blood pressure medications. This is dose dependent, so the more you take, the more benefit you'll receive. Vinegar has even been shown to help stave off sarcopenia, and in general, its effects will help slow the aging process. Aging is largely a process of damage from reactive oxygen species, and from glycation from a high carb diet and eventually you're just unable to repair all this damage because the immune system cells themselves become damaged. Thankfully vinegar will not only reduce the levels of ROS produced but also increase the ability of the body to repair this damage. Vinegar affects cytokines such as interleukin 2 in a way that actually increases the activation and efficacy of macrophages and other similar immune bodies. This switches them from the pro-inflammatory state where they can only fight pathogens to the anti-inflammatory state that's required for repairing damage to the body. This same process is a mechanism shared with both fasting and phototherapy. So in essence, vinegar is like a tiny bit of fasting in a bottle. This is also the mechanism by which stem cells are released into the body. Forcing stem cells to burn oxygen forces them out of their hypoxic niches to go seek out oxygen. They can then be used by the body to form new cells, even in seriously damaged organs. And as they migrate around, they also release mitochondria throughout the body. And this helps older cells to regenerate themselves and keeps the onset of cancer from coming. 
So while it has not been studied, it stands to reason that vinegar would also be beneficial for stem cells since it shares this mechanism and also shares several other mechanisms I won't go into, which are similar to fasting and phototherapy. I take my vinegar with some potassium bicarbonate to neutralize the acidity. Each half teaspoon of bicarbonate will neutralize 30 milliliters of vinegar. This will not negate any of the benefits of the vinegar, which are nothing to do with the acidity. You could also use sodium bicarbonate for this purpose, but there is 1200 milligrams of sodium in each half teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate, and that's quite a bit to add to the diet. However, this might work out well for you during a fast because the sodium will help you hold on to the rest of your electrolytes so you can keep from having your electrolytes fall too quickly in this manner. On days I work out, I will take 100 milliliters of neutralized vinegar about half an hour before I start. This deacidifies the body on a cellular level, which helps your muscles to have more endurance and performance, i.e. more repetitions during weightlifting. It also puts me in the mood to exercise, which is often a drag otherwise. If I forget to take my vinegar before working out, I always perform more poorly. Just make sure to use a straw and mix well, as a single crystal of potassium bicarb that's unreacted could cause some damage to your teeth. Lately I have heard that lactic acid during exercise is a good thing because it provides energy to the muscles, but this is patently false. The acidity greatly impedes muscle performance and the muscle itself can make no use of lactate for any purpose. It is forced to spend energy pushing lactate out of the cell, which drains the cell greatly. The only place that the lactate can be used is actually the liver, which then turns it into more glucose, which you probably have plenty of anyway. This process is also hard on the kidneys, which have to tightly maintain the pH levels of the blood at all times. And this is another reason that vinegar and potassium bicarbonate are so good for the body, because they help to deacidify the body, and this takes pressure off of the kidneys. And that's something you definitely want because when the kidneys deacidify things, it does so in a destructive manner. And that's why many people take vinegar for gout attacks, which has nothing to do with dietary purines and everything to do with metabolic health. And potassium bicarbonate is also going to help here because it's going to directly lower the pH of your blood so that your kidney doesn't have to do it for you. And that's why everything that helps the liver, such as TMG, has a great effect in stopping gout. And I have had more than one viewer tell me that thanks to my advice, they no longer suffer from gout. At this point, you may think there's nothing left for apple cider vinegar to do, but that's just not true. Vinegar also plays a vital role inside the gut, where it kills pathogenic bacteria like Firmicutes and promotes the beneficial bacteria. Amazingly, it has been shown that around 25% of the results of weight loss come down to your gut microbiome. That is, you can do the exact same thing and lose 25% less weight because you have these bad bacteria in your gut like Firmicutes and others that thrive on a high-carb diet. While well, you've probably been brainwashed by the media and other channels into thinking you just have to have more fiber, in reality, this does nothing to improve your microbiome which I've discussed in past videos. It does not increase butyrate content in the microbiome, but actually soaks it up and leaves it to be flushed down the toilet. In reality, limiting carbs and increasing vinegar consumption are the best ways to clear out pathogenic gut bacteria like Formicutes. These simply didn't exist before agriculture existed, and only in relatively recent times have they become one of the main parts of the gut microbiome, much to our detriment. This is also a lot of what causes cavities. Well, unfortunately, we have Mountain Dew Mouth in 18-month-olds as well, and we have the same diseases in adults as we have in children, and this is a marker for the problem. Now, the thing to know about dental caries is that this is a relatively new phenomenon. If you look at fossils from various times uh, going back, way back into the Paleolithic and Mesozoic era, eras, 
dental caries were almost non-existent. And you can see that basically it was a pretty darn low uh, uh, frequency and prevalence. It's only since the Industrial Revolution that things really took off. And I'm having, there we go. In 1934, perhaps the most seminal to this day uh, symposium on dental caries occurred in New York City. And there were two camps. There was the camp of hygiene, that is clean teeth do not decay, and they had some heavy hitters at the time, including Thaddeus Hyatt and Maurice William. These were big names in the, in the field in those days. And then there was uh, uh, the people who thought nutrition mattered, okay? So, if, if you will, team nutrition. And we had some big names there as well, including the um, uh, ever-present Weston Price. And to this day, there's a Weston Price Foundation that is uh, you know, pushing the concept of diet and chronic disease. So, we had these two groups duking it out. Who, what causes dental caries? So, there were the people who said that clean teeth do not decay. Well. Let's look at what was in our mouths. And you can actually look at the um, DNA footprinting of the various organisms that have been found on fossils. And what you can see is that the phyla in the mouth have changed over the course of time. And in particular, I want you to, to uh, uh, alert you to this blue one. And you'll notice that way back in our hunter-gatherer days, this blue one, Firmicutus, was actually relatively common in the mouth. Now it's pretty much gone. Well, where is Firmicutus today? It's in our intestine. It's actually one of the bad guys in terms of making cytokines that drive chronic metabolic disease. When we talk about the microbiome, when we talk about the bad bacteria, we're mostly talking about Firmicutus. Well, it used to be a denizen of our mouths and now it's a denizen of our intestines. It got chased down there and if you notice, also proteobacteria didn't even exist back then, and now it's taking up most of um, our mouths. So our flora have changed as we've evolved, and the question is why? In the particular, this guy over here in purple has been a major, major thorn in dentist's side. He is known as strep mutans, and this is the primary driver of dental caries but it wasn't even part of our mouths. So if you look at um, uh, uh, bacterial diversity in the mouth, you'll notice that it was relatively constant all the way through, and it's only from medieval to modern times that bacterial diversity has actually gone down as strep mutans over here has made its ugly presence felt. These kinds of bacteria require a lower pH in the gut, and vinegar destroys them very handily. Many beneficial bacteria actually produce vinegar, and the further back in time archaeologists look, the more acidic the human digestive tract was. Through a combination of fasting, vinegar, and probiotics, you can reduce and eventually eliminate these negative gut bacteria. Otherwise, they will not only impede weight loss, but also make your belly more bloated and inflamed, which makes you look worse than your weight would otherwise say. And while it's great that vinegar makes you healthy and makes you feel good, I know many people who watch these videos are also concerned about looking good, too. Hi. Hello. Not you. Hi. <laughs> 